Hi, everyone. I'm Vince Molinero, and welcome to this episode of the Lead the Future podcast. I'm really excited to have Jennifer Fondreve, who is the founder of Day One Ready, as our guest today. And she leads a consultancy that advises forward thinking business leaders and C suite leaders on how to prepare for the human capital challenges of MA. And that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. She's the uh, author of the book, What Now? A Survivor's Guide for Thriving Through Mergers and Acquisitions, and is also um, a highly regarded speaker. And Jennifer speaks from real life experience uh, as a Fortune 500 C-suite survivor of three multi-billion dollar acquisitions. She has been on all sides of the deal equation. And she saw countless growth strategies fail due to a workforce that couldn't pivot and adapt as quickly as leadership uh, anticipated. When her Harvard Business Review article, After a Merger, Don't Let Us Versus Them Thinking Ruin the Company, when that article went viral, Jennifer recognized the need for a more human-centric approach to business transformation, where really employees are at the heart of change. Uh, she shares her expertise on a number of platforms, including Forbes, uh, Harvard Business Review, uh, the Thrive Global American Marketing Association, Little Market Growth, and is a frequent podcast guest and keynote speaker and a res uh, recent uh, TEDx speaker. So uh, welcome, Jennifer, to the Lead the Future podcast. Uh, thank you for making time to join us today. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Actually seeing all of those things through the intro, I felt like I was on This Is Your Life, Jennifer Fondreve. We can make it about that if you if you want, <laughs> because in many ways, you know, this is about your life and your experiences uh, in M and A, uh, and uh, and as we've talked uh, in the past, uh, like you, I've I've had a lot of uh, experience in that as well. Probably twelve uh, mergers and acquisitions have experience acquiring, being acquired, setting yeah. up strategic partnerships. Like you, a ton of experience, and uh, these are tough experiences we, we, we for leaders out. and employees. We geeked out talking about mergers and acquisitions, didn't we? Yeah, because uh, there they can be exciting times, but also really challenging times, and that's why you know I found your book to be so so helpful. Uh, so let's start off. You know, if I'm an employee, a, a middle manager, a leader in a company, what are the signs that I need to look out for to say maybe something's happening? Uh, because you know those are the populations and companies that often. Uh, you know, an announcement comes out and and may not be aware of it. But what what are those signs that we need to pay attention to? And thank you. That's a, that's a, a the precursor in my book to how I get into here's how to handle the challenges. But I try and share my version of a crystal ball as much as I can because it's what I experienced. I will confess. I wasn't watching market trends. The first uh, acquisition I went through. Uh, I was in, uh, I was at Navtech, digital map maker, and there was a lot of change happening between Nokia uh, with the phone category, um, looking to have uh, a greater presence as far as connecting people. So I say the first and foremost is be smart on market trends. What's happening in the marketplace? Do you see a lot of contraction happening, more acquisitions or even divestitures uh, happening? The smarter you are about what's happening in the marketplace, the better informed you can be uh, of whether or not your company might be a target or that your company is looking to acquire uh, either an asset or talent that they find deficient in their company because of what's happening in the marketplace. So first and foremost, um, stay smart on the market. Um, secondly, uh, and this is the one that everyone always laughs about, but it's true, right? If you start seeing... Um, strange people in the war room. The conference room is booked a lot. Your boss seems to have a lot of block time on their calendar. Uh, I tend not to recommend this uh, as becoming your full-time job, but it is an indicator that something is happening in the company. Um, yeah. the, the, the reason why I laugh a little bit about that is that shouldn't be your only data point. If that's, if, if, if you're too obsessed about tracking for that, you're not doing your job. Uh, and for me, it's why I say, B 
be smart on what's happening in the marketplace because that's part of how you stay smart in your job as well. Um, and then, you know, just, and this comes from um, just personal development. When you have a, your own outside board of advisors, right, people who you talk to, who contribute, help you think about your career and your growth, uh, if, you've, if you've been smart about picking outside advisors who have good business experience, they can often be an outside uh, perspective, right? Somebody who shares with you, here's what I see happening in this in this industry potentially could be an indication of what might be to come for your industry. Uh, and, and all three of those, I talk in more depth about that in my book. Um, but those are things, ways to keep you smart. And, and, and what's your sense of as, you know, coming out of the pandemic and all the changes and the challenges that, you know, companies are still facing, is your sense that, you know, m and uh, activity is going to kind of keep going uh, pretty strongly Absolutely. over the next few years? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of distressed businesses still, uh, just because I don't think we'll ever be post-pandemic, at least still, we can't say that officially, but even coming out of the pandemic, you have a lot of businesses that even if they were able to weather the storm of the pandemic, you have so many more disruptive things happening. You know, um, in, in the United States, clearly inflation, although that's global, uh, I, I don't think there's one country that isn't um, suffering from inflation, the war in Ukraine. I mean, you just have supply chain issues continuing. So all of those things are contributing to businesses being distressed. And you have a lot of companies, um, private equity in particular, I think it's at a billion of dry powder, you know, capital that they still have to invest. Mm -hmm. um, so the combination of that, every predictor I've seen says, yes, m and will continue. Yeah. So I think with that, you know, in mind, you know, the, the, probably the, the best stance we can take is it's probably going to happen if it hasn't already. And, and how do we kind of equip ourselves? And then we'll, we'll dive into that a, a little bit later. Um, you also speak about kind of in your experience, you know, because there are, you know, sort of a deal like that is always done with the best intentions, right? To, to drive growth um, and, and leverage the assets of a company and maybe merge the assets of several companies to create something and uh, generate greater value in the marketplace. So those are typically the intentions, uh, but getting there isn't always easy. And, and there's lots of examples where things don't work out and, and, and outright failure. What are those reasons that you've, you have found in your experience? Well, and this is obviously my, my, my personal bias is <laughs> why I wrote the book. The, the focus tends to be on the transaction, getting the transaction done. Um, and I think, Vince, you and I even talked a little bit about bias, right? When you're, you want to get this deal done, you are looking for all the reasons that this deal makes sense, the, the similarities. You'll even, you'll even, even if you've got a red flag about culture differences, You'll look for the similarities. Oh, this is, we'll complement each other this way. Well, this will yeah. work. So because of that bias and that focus on let's just get the deal done, what happens is the people strategy, how people react to change, the consequences of significant change, which mergers and acquisitions always bring dramatic change. Yeah not appreciating the impact of that and how people react differently to change. You can never assume everyone will uniformly embrace this. That's where I see the issues arise. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny as, as you're talking, I'm remembering a personal experience. I, I wasn't in South America uh, supporting the launch of the Spanish translation of the, of my book, the leadership contract. And we went in to see an executive team. Um, and as we walked into their, their uh, office tower, there was, you know, on the TVs, banners everywhere, uh, day one, day one, day one, day one. You could not not notice <laughs> that it was day one. And without really being aware of it, uh, we were actually there on day two. And so the executive team that we met, they their company was acquired. And they were basically like, just didn't know what to do. They said, but we know there's another group like us on their side. We have not met them. We don't know who they are. There's no culture plan. So what do we do? And that was happening, you know, at the most senior level of that company. Uh, you can imagine how all of that kind of trickles down when I, I agree with you. I think sometimes culture is treated very superficially initially, uh, and then it gets paid attention to a little bit later. But 
for employees, a lot of times the culture elements is the biggest priority in many ways. Yeah. And, and uh, so one, I, I laugh for a number of reasons. I've, I was on the receiving end. I know what that looks like. My company is called Day One Ready <laughs> for that very reason, right? Because being Day One Ready isn't like, okay, we've unfurled the banner. Now we're, it's Day One. There's a lot that goes with being Day One Ready, that integration preparation. The standard is, you know, the various work streams and whatnot. And thankfully, businesses are hiring me more and more because they've acknowledged, wow, to be Day One Ready, I got to be smart about the communications, the employee experience, the, the, the cultural integration and assimilation. How do we think about that? What's the plan for that? Right. If you delay that discussion, you aren't day one ready. You just got a nice banner and a town hall, and that's about uh, what you're ready for. Yeah, maybe T-shirts to go along with it. <laughs> or, or a little squishy on your desk. Right. So, so, you know, the, the, uh, what's also great about your book is you really do outline kind of what employees go through as they react to that kind of an announcement and those kind of changes. And you kind of, you know, make the analogy to stages of grief and, and speak a little bit about that, because I think that's important for us to understand for ourselves personally, but also if you're leading a team, know that you'll see some of these things. Well, it's, it's fascinating to me because the stages of grief was an epiphany moment for me. I couldn't understand in the acquisitions that I went through why there were times where I was really angry and then why I actually went through a, a state of depression. And it was while I was interviewing a CEO for my book, I did about three years worth of research and interviewed over 60 plus executives. And it was one CEO in particular when he and I got into a conversation about what happens, how people react. And his mother was a uh, grief counselor. And when I described it, he said, well, I've witnessed that too. It's your, your organization goes through the stages of grief. It is like losing um, a loved one. It is, it's losing a part of you. And what just made so much sense for me is when he said, because now you're suffering what's called ambiguous loss, right? It's the future you had in your head. It's the future that we all typically envision for ourselves, right? If you're an ambitious um, uh, employee and you want to do well at a company and you have been doing well, now suddenly all of that's called into question. Yeah, and even yeah. though you didn't have certainty, it was the plan that you had in your head. It was what you were working towards. You've identified with this company. And now all of that is, you don't know what it is. It's not necessarily good or bad, but we tend to go to the negative. And so I thought as soon as he shared that, it was a light bulb moment for me. And then as I talked to people, interviewing them for the book, consistently people said, that's it, yeah. right? You go from denial to acceptance. And the... The other aspect of that that rang true for everyone I interviewed and people who have read my book, it's not a linear process. We, we Even in grieving, um, you've seen everyone, um, or I shouldn't say everyone, but you've seen people react differently to grief. How we grieve um, changes by individual, and it's the same through a merger and acquisition. And so that's one of the reasons I emphasize in particular for CEOs this isn't a linear process. You can't yeah, assume, yeah. assume a time frame um, because people will get to acceptance at different rates. And what I've learned uh, as well, and I don't know if you've seen this, but it also happens uh, with you know employees and leaders of the company that did the acquisition. I think it hits them later because what happens is you know it's it's the company that's been acquired where exactly that grief stick you know uh, because you've lost control. And as you said, right, you're what you thought was going to be your career or, you know, your relative position and stature in your company has been upended and you start that process. But then, you know, as, as new employees of the company that's been acquired get, you know, they get elevated. Then I start seeing the same kind of behaviors of the acquiring company where yes. some employees now start feeling like, well, I had a plan. Wait a minute. Why did they just promote that person? I was up. I, I was in line for that. And you see some similar behaviors coming a little later. I don't know if you've seen that as well. Absolutely. I'm really glad you said that. There's a tendency to think, 
oh, this is just, these feelings are exclusive to the company that gets acquired. But that's not the case. This M&A deal happened for a reason. Both companies needed each other. Even if there's a tendency, uh, and I'm actually doing another article on this around acquisition arrogance, even if that exists, the changes impact both sides, right? Now you're both in this together. And, and you can see that even if, to your point, it's delayed, uh, change impacts the acquiring company's employees uh, as well. So uh, I'm really glad you pointed that out because I said, you know, it's, it's both sides. Both sides have uh, consequences. Yeah. yeah. And so as, as, as we're talking through this um, and, and you, and you kind of write about these cat, this cast of characters uh, and personalities that emerge, because in my experience, uh, the, these events either can bring the best in people or the absolute worst. And, and talk to us about a few of these uh, uh, kind of personalities that can emerge and, um, and you describe them so, so uh, effectively in your book. Well, and, and, and first I have to give props um, to the illustrator, uh, Jeff York, because I've had people say to me, wow, you're a great illustrator. And I thought, oh, <laughs> if only I could draw that well. Uh, my past life, I was in advertising, and uh, he was an amazing um, director I worked with who just uh, also happened to be a, an extremely talented illustrator. And what's the benefit of that is bringing these certain personalities to life. I wanted to not um, judge people, but simply highlight we probably each have these tendencies. Right? When, I, when I talked with CEOs in particular, and, and I just showed the picture, they hadn't, I hadn't even started talking, right? So I showed the know-it-all. And they immediately said, oh, that's the know-it-all. We've had, I, we don't even need a merger and acquisition to suffer from a know-it-all. And the, the issue or the challenge, I should say, with, uh, with know-it-alls, particularly in a merger and acquisition, is they can squash collaboration. There's a tendency... Let's just, I'll play out a scenario. Acquiring company acquires another company and the acquiring company um, has a know-it-all. The people who've been acquired, if you're in meetings repeatedly where someone says, oh, we've been there, we've tried that, that won't work. This is, um, we spent millions of dollars pushing that effort. You can have, an, and I know I went through this in one of my acquisitions, you finally get to the point, well, then why did you acquire us? What, what's right. the... What's the point of this if, if you've already tried all of these things? Yeah. So a know-it-all um, can really undermine the success of your deal if, if not, not curbed. Uh, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one of the examples I give with that personality in particular is you need to demonstrate it's okay to not have every answer. That's, what, that's where innovation comes from, right? Challenging status quo questioning, well, what if we did this? What if we tried that? And the more that you demonstrate that that's okay, the, the better chance you have of, of squashing uh, the, the impact of a know-it-all. Um, another character that tends to, everybody always laughs about the former rock star. Uh, that is the person who, and it can be, again, either company, but they're the person who had the Midas touch they could be your head of sales, your chief technology officer. They could be an up and comer, but it's that person who, who had the ear of the CEO, who was really considered someone that everyone admired and looked to. And what can happen during a merger and acquisition is the metrics for success change. Uh, they have to, it's the reason why these companies are coming together. Uh, this is the new growth strategy. There was a need for a pivot. And if your rock star, uh, doesn't appreciate that the metrics for success have changed, but what made them successful to get here may not be the same formula that's going to make them successful moving forward against these new metrics. And if they miss that shift, they can become a former rock star. Uh, I've had repeatedly private equity um, CEOs who've done, gone to multiple businesses who all say, oh, we had someone who I thought was going to really embrace this and, and do great things, and they struggled uh, and, and could not pivot. Um, so those two characters, I you know, we've got 10. Yeah. The ones that tend to get a lot of attention because everyone has witnessed or experienced one of those personalities in particular. Yeah, and, and, those, and those moments uh, really um, act as an inflection point. And 
uh, in the work we do. That, that's where we focus our work with companies. And what happens there is essentially it changes the expectations of leaders and how they need to step up. And, and some are able to do so. And, and, and in, in that example that you cite, uh, some struggle. So it's not always guaranteed that your rock stars will continue to be rock stars in that instance. Yeah. And you know what, what was... What has been enormously helpful is because I made them caricatures. Yeah. When I have those sessions with CEOs and their teams, they all I they they can all pick out a few. And it allows us to have a discussion to say, okay, so how might this personality type undermine what you're going for, what you're trying to achieve with this deal? Yeah. Because you're now basing your transaction with on you know a static moment in time. But this is what happens when people have a lot of change thrust upon them. You will see a different side of them, not always the best version. Yeah. Let's, let's just be prepared for that. And that's what I really, um, I, I'm thankful that, you know, I had the idea to turn them into characters that people can identify with, because the more you talk about that and prepare for it, it gives you a greater chance for success. Yeah. And to your point, right, um, people are put under a lot of pressure, different stressors, and they may not always be at their best. So approaching it in a judgmental way really doesn't doesn't help us. Uh, but being able, as I did, as I went through it, and I kind of identified myself a few times and so not in a positive way. But uh, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that's sort of what what is. And that's the value of, of those, um, you know, those 10 caricatures that you've identified is, uh, it, you know, and they're, they're great illustrations and they're fun. And so it adds a lightness to what is a, t a tough topic to discuss sometimes. Yeah. And then if, it, if it makes you feel any better in, in one of the sessions that I do, I have a couple of people read out loud and they try and guess who the character is. And I can't tell you how many times someone has said, oh, my God, this is me. Right? <laughs> oh, I, I've been this person. So uh, you are not alone. Yeah. So in the end, um, you know, if we can keep with the storyline that the activity uh, is going to continue and increase, that we should probably be expecting that if we haven't at this point in our career, live through, uh, you know, one of these, it's going to happen at some point. And so how do we best prepare ourselves? And if we're leading uh, others, leading teams, leading uh, companies, how do we also prepare our teams for uh, the eventuality of when this happens? What, what words of wisdom do you have there? I, and it's, it's because I walked this road and I messed up or I, I suffered, um, particularly in that first acquisition, I wish someone had said, you're, you're essentially, don't rest on your laurels. Don't rest on your past achievements, right? You can be proud of them. And I was absolutely proud of them. But if you stay stuck holding on to your past achievements, you're, you're not contributing to the new way forward. And so first and foremost, uh, I, I just, I highlight to people, it's not as though I'm saying, hey, you're interviewing for your job again, but if you just stay focused on, yes, but look at this longer, you know, my resume, my bullets of all these achievements, it doesn't matter because what the company and both sides, right, whether you're acquired or acquiring, um, you're, how do you contribute to the future? And secondly, then I say, what you need to be clear on, don't cling to your title either. You need to be crystal clear on what is your real talent. How can you contribute to this company? So first and foremost, what's your talent, right? It's not just your job description or the things that are, are listed in your, your performance. There, We have uh, enormous talent that we can provide to a company. Be crystal clear on that and then demonstrate through your effort uh, how you can contribute, right? I call it my TEA, your talent, your effort, and your attitude. Those three things beyond just letting go of the past, the more that you show effort, you're not tied to, hey, I was the director of this, but this is what I can contribute. And here's how I can do it and put your all into that. Yeah. You'll create opportunities for yourself. And then lastly, yeah. your attitude. I can't tell you how many people through M&A deals might not have had the long, robust list of achievements, but they just had a positive attitude. They looked to contribute. They wanted to find opportunities to learn and grow, but equally contribute. And those are the people who succeeded through all of the change. And I think, I think building on that, um, what I also have found valuable in the people you appreciate are those who have 
you know, they're almost detached from it. And it's like, well, you know, I'm going to be all in. Let's see how this goes. But if it doesn't work out, if I'm if I'm feeling like there isn't a fit, then I'm not going to stick around and and be a barrier to change. I'll just I'll just move on. Right. Yeah. And, and that's also highly, you know, valued and respected, uh, you know, when people have really kind of take that personal ownership to say, I get the deal um, may not work uh, for me. But, you know, because the, the worst thing is when people kind of feel like they have to stick around, but are, are not making that leap that you speak of. Right. That that becomes um, a challenge for sure. Yeah. And, you know, you've put a finer point on my, you know, when I say let go of past achievements, it's let go yeah. of ego. Yeah. Right. It's it's to to your point. Um, and it's hard because we tend to, you know, particularly if we've given our blood, sweat and tears to a company that can be hard to do. But yeah. as you said, the the better you are at doing that, the more you can find you'll the more you will see opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think related to that, too, is sometimes and I don't know what you, what you have found uh as well in your experience is uh, sometimes people get paralyzed, right? And and they feel like, particularly if you're on the company that's been acquired, they, they need to look around for permission. And so, and without it, they they don't move ahead. And, and I think there's a little bit of courage you need to have that says, okay, well, to your point, if you trust your talents, uh, if you're bringing a positive attitude, just just go, just just go and see, see how far you can go because, people are so busy dealing with so many other issues that they're not necessarily worrying about giving you permission on what you need to do. They've acquired you. There's some value that they see in you just go. And, right. and I've learned, and it's been one thing that I've, I, it's a conversation I've had repeatedly with people who found themselves in that situation. And I said, you know, don't, don't wait, take steps, look up. If no one notices, keep going. And the system at one point will tell you if you've gone one step too far and that's okay, but you've maybe taken 20 steps as opposed to waiting way back here, uh, you know, uh, at step one that you didn't take. So I think it does require a little bit of courage in those environments to, you know, trust yourself, know you're going to add value and, and charge your head because that's exactly what the company needs you to do. Right, exactly. I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up. And, and I write about that uh, through two characters, right? The ostrich, yeah. Yeah. that person just stays stuck in denial. Who, who's just like, this is all going to go away. You know, we're going to go back to the way things used to be. I just need to wait this out. Uh, and then my missing in action um, characters, right? Those are the people who never volunteer for anything. I joke, you've, you've probably confronted them on conference calls where you hear their name, but they never volunteer. They don't step up. They don't take on projects. They're just waiting to see how things are going to play out. And exactly as you said, um, that's a dangerous thing to do because you're going to be left behind. Cool. So uh, uh, just two more questions. Uh, this one is sort of spontaneous, but if if you were to be speaking to a CEO that has just you know done a deal, what would you say is at all costs, avoid this mistake? What would that, <laughs> yeah. what would that be? I have an answer. All right. Do I not know. say nothing's going to change. Ah. Uh, CEOs repeatedly, and the intentions are good. Yeah. The intention is to just calm people down. You know, everyone's stressing out. But if you say, hey, everything's going to stay the same. This is a good thing. The fact is, everything's already changed. Right. As, as we talked about earlier in our discussion, my future, my certainty of where I saw things going. Yeah. So even if in the short term, maybe nothing's going to change, there's so much you cannot control as as the integration plays out, as the companies come together, as you know, a strategy shifts, as you learn new things and have to recalibrate. Yeah. So um, I can't tell you how many times when I put up the top 10 things that uh, executives say, and here's how the workforce hears it. And the number one thing <laughs> I'll point out is executives say nothing's going to change. But what your workforce hears is, are you kidding me? <laughs> And I'll add another one that's come up in conversations uh, when organizations we work with have been in that is, is uh, when it's the two CEOs coming in and saying, our cultures are so aligned, our values are exactly the same. It's like we were meant to be together. Yes. Uh, and then over time, people realize, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're the yin to their yang. <laughs> Which is no. a good thing too, right? Like that 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 diversity is is great for growth and and innovation, but um, it, it's also hard, right? 
So one la last question for you. It's one we ask all of our podcast guests. And, and it's really your perspective for young people that are either just entering the workforce uh, at a fascinating time as the world of work is, is uh you know, really being changed dramatically, uh, or have been in the workforce for a few years and maybe, uh, you know, taking on a role as a supervisor or team lead uh, uh, or people manager for the first time, you know, in their career. What, what, what would be your leadership advice or words of wisdom to them? You know, the, well, there's, there's two things, and I touched on it before. I have seen the most successful young leaders, where they are successful is they approach every project, every even late night as a learning opportunity. They're, they're learning and growing and they see it that way. And I, I think the complement of that is having that positive attitude. I have seen people who are wicked smart, but have a negative attitude right? They, oh, this is a project. I'm so uh, overwhelmed. I, I, I'm, I really need to get in front of the CEO. I need these opportunities. They don't look at the project as exactly that, a learning opportunity, and they don't approach it with a positive attitude. So, and thankfully I've been um, asked to speak to young leaders uh, a lot recently because of mergers and acquisitions happening in so many different industries and so many companies. And I, I, really highlight the importance of having a positive attitude and approaching every project uh, and, and opportunity as a growth opportunity, something that allows you to learn and look for those opportunities. That's great. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate your amazing insights. Congrats again on your book. Um, and there's so many insights for uh, any leader, uh, any manager, any employee who may find themselves uh, in that position. It's a handy guide to help you, uh, you know, live through those uh, challenging, but also very exciting opportunities. So thanks for uh, joining us on the Lead the Future podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vince.